Like, shut up, dude. I'm so over it. I get so much five, shit, but at least mine, <laughs> mine are defined. And you give 92% of your ratings are 3.5. It makes no sense. I will hear none of it. At least, do you have the same rating system as Jason? And somehow Jason's makes infinite more sense than yours does. Like, it baffles me. That's because I like everything, but don't like everything because it's all the same. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. Big week this week. Elton John, one of the biggest we've done in a while. Maybe the biggest since Neil Young week. 35 albums. We first mentioned the idea of doing Elton John a couple months ago, maybe a little prematurely, but we finally got through all the albums and we are ranking them tonight. We're counting 35. This is a remaster. I've heard all except a couple new ones that we've added into the mix. We all know Elton John. We all know a lot of his albums. We won't get into the full breakdown of what we've heard. Uh, you guys can make mention of that as we go through if you like, but we're trying to plow through this pretty quickly. So let's get right into it. Cram is going to kick it off with his bottom five. We'll go five at a time until our top tens. All right, here we go. Number 35, I've got the Lockdown Sessions. Two stars. I don't go below two stars. I think he's got bad albums, but not terrible albums. This is unnecessary and barely an Elton John album. He's just ruining some of his stuff. He's ruining other stuff. I despise Cold Heart so much. The mix, the style, the vocal effects, just all bad, except for the cover of Nothing Else Matters. Miley Cyrus kills it on there. Number 34, I've got Leather Jackets, two stars, incredibly cheesy sounds, nothing to it. It's just all mall montage music from the 80s. So artificial, so humanless, so lame and sappy, just heartstrings being pulled everywhere. And on top of it, not a single fresh new idea, just recycled moments and thoughts from his other 80s stuff. What is the motivation for a record like this? Number 33, I got Red Strikes Back, still at two stars. Pete Townsend guest starring on, the, guest starring on this, Can't Save It. Just 80s fluff. Is it rock? Is it pop? What is it? And the sounds are even bigger and bolder than his other 80s stuff here on this album. Like, it's his Heartbeat City or something. Production's just full throttle. A word in Spanish is pointless. Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's part two? Why? Goodbye, Marlon Brando continues his trend of ruining reputations. Poor Cow is hilarious. Sounds like someone doing an Elton John impression. Number 32, here's where I've got Victim of Love. Two stars, slowed down, weird disco version of Johnny B. Goods. One of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. It's super lame, super corny, none of the fun of disco, none of the grit of rock. That said, I don't think it's as bad as most people do. The beats are solid. It's whatever. I don't actively hate it. And I legit kind of like Thunder in the Night. And then number 31, I've got Jump Up, still at two stars. I feel like this whole thing is just too corny. There's no good songwriting on it. Dear John is lame. Empty Garden, I know, got a lot of critical acclaim, but I don't care for it. I find it quite tacky, and it doesn't compare to his goodbye note to Marilyn Monroe. Blue Eyes is sappy as hell. A song like Princess just seems so phony. It's almost like he's not being himself at all. All right. Here we go. I pretty much agree with a lot of what Cram said there in his bottom five. You'll see some of those albums again. My big disagreement with him is with Jump Up, which I think is pretty solid. Uh, number 35 for me is the same as Cram. We are united at the bottom with the lockdown sessions. I dislike it even more than he does. You know, one of the things I most respect about Elton John is that he has always stayed really in tune to what's going on with new music. He always is into new stuff. I think, you know, back in the day, he used to go to Tower Records every week and buy every new release. And I think he still pretty much does that. He buys records all the time. He knows what's going on. But this is just horrible. He's trying to, I don't know, it feels very forced. Why does this exist? It shouldn't exist. And, you know, I know a lot of people died during the pandemic, and I won't say anything to diminish that. But this album being made was the worst effect the pandemic had on my life and having to listen to it. I never got COVID. I don't know anyone that died from COVID. This is a piece of trash, and it is the fourth zero star I have given on this channel. It is total, total garbage. One spot up from there, I've got Victim of Love, which was my bottom record the last time I did the ranking. Such an, a massive drop-off from Single Man to this. One of the biggest disparities between two consecutive albums that I can think of. It opens with the worst cover of Johnny Be Good imaginable. I don't think you could come up with something worse than this if you were trying to do worse. 
Uh, someone in our Discord described it as simultaneously too fast and too slow. Elton sounds like Kermit the Frog singing it. This is a weird record because he didn't write any of the songs and he doesn't play piano on it. He just walked into the booth and sang and it feels like that. He feels totally checked out. There's no heart or soul in any of the tracks. Uh, you got some good musicians, Marcus Miller on bass, Steve Lucas, Lukather plays a couple solos, but artistically speaking, it is one of the most vacuous albums you will ever hear. My number 33 is Duets. Everything that made the one suck before it, but he brings a bunch of guest singers along this time and drags them through the stink of his early 90s career. You know, and for having different producers on every track, it has a uniformly sucky sound. It's absolutely terrible pretty much the whole way through. The Leonard Cohen performance, probably uh, the best track on it because it is the only moment on the record that goes against the grain of being anonymously pleasant. It's the only thing that stands out at all. And not that it's even that great. I've got that at one and a half stars. Number 32, I've got The Big Picture. I don't know why he kept going back to Chris Thomas as a producer. He'd make a good record and then he'd go back to Chris Thomas and just suck again. Uh, just so disappointing. This album blows. It's got all of the problems of his early 90s stuff, but with these addict, added electronic touches that make things even worse. I hate the songs. I hate the sound. The way there's like this weird fade in on If the River Can Bend, it's just like, why is this happening? Uh, and like I said, just following the disappointment of finally starting to sound good again on the previous record made in England and then reverting back to this absolute crap is so disappointing. Uh, my number 31 is the somewhat previously mentioned The One, 11 tracks, 60 minutes, just insufferable 90s adult contemporary. I think the production has improved from some of the production on the 80s records, but I just hate the vibe of it. It is just so content to churn out these mindless ballads. Um, one of his least artistic efforts, uh, at least since Victim of Love. Uh, just total crap. I've also got that at one and a half stars. All right, Jason. Way, way too harsh. Oh, come on. Uh, number 35 for me is going to be duets. This is interminable. Uh, don't go breaking my heart with RuPaul. Probably a new low in this catalog. Uh, just awful, awful music. Number 34, Reg Strikes Back. Uh, Chris Thomas, just, if anyone's more responsible for Elton John going downhill in the 80s, I'd like to, to see who that person would be because his production just ruins his, I mean, everything he touches in the 80s sucks. There are some albums where you could legitimately say, you know, with good production, this could have been a good album, but this isn't really one of them uh, because it's still bad. The songwriting isn't good. It's two stars. I think Poor Cow and Since God Invented Girls are really the only even things worth uh, listening to here. Number 33, I I like it. I like the, the Beach Boys stuff. It's weird. He, he works with Bruce Johnson a lot. Number 33, Leather Jackets. I like this one a little bit more than Red Strikes Back, but not a lot. I don't think it's embarrassingly bad other than the front cover and the 80s synth sounds. But it, I mean, it's just like so anonymously boring that I don't know, I can't remember anything about it. Uh, still at two stars for that. Uh, we'll jump up for two and a half for Ice on Fire. Uh, it's very 80s sounding. It's very like adult contemporary, which he Elton really got deep in the adult contemporary right in the middle of the 80s and didn't really get out of it until 2001 barring a couple detours but this one you know you got nikita pretty weak single and um i don't know the production again sucks and the choice of sin sounds and i don't know there's just not a lot here to to talk about so two and a half for ice and fire and then 31 most people's bottom but I don't think it's uh, it's bad, but it's kind of fun in some ways. Victim of Love from 79. Um, I actually kind of like the music a little bit. Like it's very disco and it definitely missed like disco by three to four years. And once you get past Johnny Be Good, which is a lot, it's eight minutes of <laughs> just one of the most ill-advised covers of all time. Um, he kind of gets fun. Born Bad, I think, is actually really fun. 
disco song. Thunder in the Night has like some Giorgio Moroder in it. And um, I mean, it's not great, but it's kind of fun to see like Elton really embrace disco. So it's two and a half stars. It's it's not good, but it's not nearly the disaster. I think everyone thinks it is. Where the hell is the lockdown sessions? What is going on? What, you, not even in the bottom five? All right. My number 30. I've got duets. It's too damn long. It's unbearable. But at least there's a little bit of life and excitement to it. Nothing really that I like that much, but I appreciate the fact that he seems to have friends and is having some fun with it. Teardrops is okay. That's why it's the first song in the album. Don't Go Breaking My Heart with RuPaul was a choice. The Stevie Wonder collab is okay. Terrible production everywhere. That seems like it's just paint thrown on a canvas, but it's got a special kind of quality to me that just like the ridiculousness of it all saves it from being the worst of his stuff. At least he took some chances on this one. Two stars for that. Number 29, I'm still at two stars for the one. I think the production on this album is just as bad. It's like the heaviest and wettest blanket of terrible sounding crap that he's got. God, I hate the harmonica and the opener. And the production is just kind of all over the place. It's way too much. The tackiest stuff ever. And the songwriting isn't there to back it up. This is barely an Elton John album to me. Like what's with the 70s sci-fi synth on Sweat It Out, which is also just like this 10 years too late, like 80s aerobic kind of sounding song. I don't get it. Runaway Train is the Clapton led one. That one's okay, but not really. There's just so much plastic feel on here and there's not really any hooks or anything to grab onto. Number 28, so at two stars, we're talking about four albums here. The big picture, big adult contemporary vibes here, but with like a weird kind of 80s like saturation to it. It lacks heart, soul, excitement, passion, piano, everything you want. And an Elton John album, it's not here. Live Like Horses, it's just way too on the nose. Literally nothing interesting on this album. I almost want to put it dead last because like I have nothing to write about it because it's just so blah. But you get some of his wannabe like blue eyed soul stuff that he should have just left to Phil Collins to make lousily, lousily, make lousy, yeah, make lousy album by Phil Collins. I hate that synth sound in January. Number 27, I've got Sleeping with the Past, and we're finally up to decent albums here 2.5 for Sleeping in the, with the Past. Uh, Durban Deep, the lead off, is very good. I think it's got some kind of reggae flair to it, maybe for the first time in its catalog. Apparently meant to pay homage to his favorite like 60s soul artists that him and Bernie love. I don't get a ton of that. There's a little bit. Uh, but the stuff I do get isn't too bad. Healing Hands and Sacrifice are the best of the album. I actually have some fun with Dancing in the End Zone. These 80s albums are just so uninspired to me. They're like AI created what it thinks Elton John would do as an album for each year that it comes out. Number 26, I've got 21 at 33. 2.5 stars here. Pretty gross riff on uh, Chasing the Crown, which isn't a d bad song. He's abandoning most of the disco that came with Rhythm of Love, more so getting back into rocking, letting Johnstone do more of his thing, which is nice. The piano's turned up a little bit here. He's also starting to embrace a little bit too much yacht rock and soft rock kind of stuff for me. I don't really care for Little Genie. I kind of dig Sartorial Eloquence. The songs are mostly forgettable, and th this one suffers from being way too bland and mid-tempo. Which even in his bad 80s stuff, at least he's got some variations with like upbeat stuff and downbeat stuff, which you can kind of get into. But on this one, it doesn't happen. Okay, my number 30 is a record that I wish I could have put lower, but there's just too many other bad records. Uh, it's Reg Strikes Back. I hate the sound of this record. The records before it are more overtly 80s and have more of that like synth cheesiness, but this record sounds just as bad in a different way. That guitar sound on Mona Lisa's part two is like the worst thing I've ever heard. It sounds terrible. Japanese Hands, I think probably the best melody on the record, but it really exposes Toppin for the overrated lyricist that I think he is, especially at certain times. He's got a really, really, <laughs> there's a ton of bad lyrics on this record. It's probably his worst lyrical record since God Invented Girls, I think is even worse. And hearing Elton try to sell those lyrics is pretty cringe inducing. Poor cow is terrible. Uh, you know, Toppin's often bad, but it's usually just like a line or two at a time. Like he'll have a, a weird clunker line in an otherwise pretty good song, but he is consistently awful on this album. One and a half stars. My number 29 is Leather Jackets, 
which is kind of just like Ice on Fire Part 2, but with it even lesser songs. Elton called the lead single Heartache All Over the World the worst song he'd ever written, and that was the lead single, so that tells you how the rest of the album probably is. Uh, for the second album in a row, you've got Roger Taylor and John Deacon showing up on this album. They're on a track called Angeline, but it doesn't matter. Their performances are completely anonymous. They could have been anybody at all. Uh, I've got that at one and a half stars as well. Number 28, I have the record that preceded that one. I've got Ice on Fire. Um, so he goes from the disappointing mediocrity of breaking hearts into this one which is like full-on 80s excess the songs themselves i don't think are actually terrible here but there's nothing really that special either and the sound of it is just not what elton should ever be doing just way too much synthy kind of 80s cheese um, again you've got roger taylor john deacon on the song too young but it doesn't offer up too much of interest anyways two stars for that one at number 27, I've got The Diving Board, which is a T-Bone Brunette production, but without the joy of this like rekindled friendship and collaboration that existed on the union, um, it's missing the variety that Leon Russell's voice brought to things. And it's meant to really showcase Elton's piano playing, which you think would be like a big plus for an Elton John record. But like so many T-Bone Burnett records, the arrangements are just too restrained for their own good. I think ultimately the melodies just aren't really as good as you would come to expect from Elton John either. You know, he was a massive pop star for decades because he's one of the best uh, melody writers of all time, I think. And this might be his least memorable and least melodic batch of tunes that he ever wrote. And it goes on for an hour. I just find it pretty damn boring. Um, I've got that at two and a half stars. And lastly, for this set of records, number 26 is going to be Breaking Hearts. Just way too cookie cutter. You've got like the same bouncy rhythms that he's been doing for several albums now. All, all of the songs feel like 10 other different, better Elton John songs. The production, I think, completely neuters the great band and the playing on it. And I cannot believe that Passengers was a single. Such a weird song to release as the second single of the record. Sad Songs is okay. It kind of reminds me of the Golden Girls theme. I always expect him to say you're a pal and a confidant. Uh, at one point, the way the lyric, the way the melody kind of leads you into that. Uh, In Neon and Burning Buildings are decent. I think it gets a little bit better at the end, uh, but ultimately it's just too much forgettable stuff and none of it really stacks up to his classic work. So two and a half stars. Okay. I Nobody's had anything crazy yet. So uh, we're good. We're good for now. Uh, my number 30, right? My number 30 is going to be Sleeping with the Past. Uh, this is, I don't know, his last album for Rehab. Like Ramsey said, he's trying to do like homage to soul and art. I mean, none of that comes across at all. Like, I just assume this was just another 80s Elton record produced by Chris Thomas poorly yet again. And uh, yeah, Sacrifice was his first uk number one that is one of the most bizarre things i learned this entire time that song's no good and how did he not have number one in the uk his home country it's odd uh number 29 i got the one and this is his first album after rehab and again chris thomas comes around to just ruin things Pretty strong band. I mean, he's got like Pino Palladino and bass and Eric Clapton stops by. Davy Johnstone's back on guitar. Uh, David Gilmore, like some solid people here. It's completely unmemorable. The production's terrible again. And the songs are just, you know, so-so um, at best. Number 28, here it comes, Jason. The Lockdown Sessions. You know, it's not great, but it's more memorable, I think, than a lot of his 80s and 90s work. And I think there's some decent songs. I like the um, the one with Eddie Vedder, E-Ticket. I like the one with Stevie Wonder a lot. I think it's a really good song, Finish Line. Uh, they, I mean, there's some weird stuff, but I think as a whole, it kind of works. Uh, the Charlie Puth one's okay. 
Pink Phantom one's good. It's a sin with years and years. I think it's really good. I think it's a fine right. I mean, I I was expecting to really hate it because I skipped it before, but I, I think it's decent. Um, interesting listen. Three stars. Number 27, I got Made in England, which everyone seems to like a lot, but I found rather boring. I know the the production, everyone talks about how this production is so much better. And I guess it is, but it just sounds like super 90s production to me. Like it, the songs are still kind of boring. He's getting into the like deep voice and it, it just doesn't really work for me. Maybe I need to give another chance, but I don't know. I probably won't. Number 26, I got Franz, which is the soundtrack he made in 1971 um i mean if it was a real album it would probably be higher on my list but it's like four or five songs maybe and some instrumentals and i don't know it's just one of these you know, every every freaking uh, artist that we do has like two or three of these soundtrack things that you know it's kind of like percy with the kinks could have been a decent album it's right in his you know like fertile period but uh, it's just kind of there. Uh, three stars for that as well. All right. 25, 25 through 21, starting with a decent album, 2.5. Ice on Fire, one of my more favorite, preferable 80s records of his. There's some fun on here, but lots of synthetic horns and keys and drums. Lively bass on a lot of stuff, especially on Soul Glove, which might be my favorite on the record. But they take it too far with stuff like Nikita and Rapper Up. Too Young is okay. And hey, you had another song called Satellite. Number 24, Breaking Hearts. I've got this at 2.5. I feel like there could be something here. John Stone actually has some nice guitar work, but it's too smooth, too sterile, too clean, and desperately needs some like cymbal crashing and low end in it. Who Wears These Shoes is decent. There's some nice musicianship and performances on here. The songs are breathing a little more, but still not fully gelling. Number 23, I've got The Fox, 2.5. Still a bit too cheesy, even for the 80s, but I like some of the musicianship again, like the piano and Breaking Down Barriers. I like the funky guitar and Heart in the Right Place. Um, it's just like this period has no chemistry between what's happening musically and the feeling of the songs, which is the strength of his best stuff. I do like Just Like Belgium a good bit, actually. I think he's in the 80s just trying to be so relevant, but doesn't really understand at the core what these new sounds and movements and stuff in the 80s going on are. Nobody Wins seems like a big misfire. Heels of the Wind seems like an old throwback kind of song that doesn't belong on the album, but I really like some of the sounds and musicianship on here. Number 22, here's where I've got Made in England. I don't think it's as good of, as a lot of people do, but I've got it at 2.5. I think it does have a clear-cut vision and idea not a ton of production getting in the way it's more stripped down but very adult contemporary for the 90s title track has a nice lead guitar in it the songs generally breathe more not as cluttered house is a bore fest though at its worst there's some very boring stuff on here which in elton's case for me is better than when elton is annoying his voice sounds good on it it's soothing pain is pretty good so is belfast and i like the way the album kind of finishes with lies and blessed and then at number 21, I've got Peachtree Road 2.5, also known as the one that looks like a Neil Young album cover, self-produced. It's a bit bland at times, but I think the songwriting is pretty good. Some of his better later stuff, kind of a revisit to Americana themes, but much more of a singer-songwriter kind of feel with some folky production aspects. I like Porch Swing and Tupelo a good bit, but there's also still songs that sound too familiar Answer in the Sky sounds like nothing and also 14 other Elton John songs all at once. They call her The Cat is Fun and Loose. 2.5, he's getting there for me with Peachtree Road. All right, my number 25 is Too Low for Zero. Got top and back writing all the songs. All the keys are played by Elton John again. You've got the classic band in place. So the narrative is there for, for people to write about this record and talk about it as a comeback. And that's what people did, and that's what the public seems to believe, but I don't buy it a bit. Uh, opens well with Cold as Christmas, which I think is good, but after that, it, it's all downhill. I hate I'm Still Standing. It's one of my least favorite Elton John songs. I think it's terrible. Uh, the title track sucks. None of the other songs are memorable. It's boring and cookie cutter. 
And I'd rather the cheesy personality of I am your robot than this absolute nothingness, frustratingly bland, disappointing. Uh, and the band, the players sound nothing like their old selves. Uh, my number 24 is Wonderful Crazy Night, uh, which of the T-Bone Burnett produced records, probably um, the best produced. I think at least there's like some upbeat energy this time around. The arrangements have some life to them. Not every song is treated like it's a funeral dirge. I definitely had this in the diving board in the wrong order last time on my original video. Uh, I think this is clearly better. Not sure what I was thinking then. Wonderful Crazy Night is fun. Has a nice guitar solo. Claw Hammer and Blue Wonderful, I think, are catchy. Production's not too bad, like I said. And Elton's, uh, Elton's voice, though, I think noticeably weaker than it has been. Uh, but not terrible. Three stars for that one. Uh, my number 23 is 21 at 33. Uh, back with Clive Franks, who produced a single man for this one. And I think how good you think this is depends on your perspective. I think it's light years better than Victim of Love, so it's an improvement over that. I think Little Genie is a pretty nice little pop ballad, but I don't know. I, I It feels too much like session work, which most of it is. You got like Steve Lukather and Lenny Castro and Henley and Timothy B. Schmidt, and it just doesn't really feel like a band like his best stuff does. Um, it feels a little factory formed and like the songs are coming out of a song factory or something it's just not a lot of personality to it um it's nice to have olsen and murray reunited on a track but not nearly enough to save the record my number 22 was a record that i think i like sounds like a little bit more than you guys do i've got sleeping with the past cram mentioned durban deep as a strong opener i think it's the worst song on the record um but everything after that, I think, is decent. Like you guys said, you don't get a lot of that R&B that they were aiming for. They said they were inspired by Billy Joel's An Innocent Man. And that's what it sounds like. It sounds like an imitation of an imitation. Um, but better songs here than he's been having. Some strong melodies, Healing Hands, Sacrifice, Amazes Me, and Blue Avenue, I think, are all pretty good songs. Even though they are just kind of like 80s ballads, they're still good for what they are. Um, you know, not an amazing record, but at least somewhat restrained production this time out it's not totally 80s out so i think it's his best since jump up i've got it at three stars uh number 21 i've got the same number 21 is crams or i've got peach tree road it's his only self-produced album in his catalog which is interesting you've got members of chicago on horns and you've got nigel olsen drumming on all the tracks kind of follows in the footsteps of songs from the west coast it's got that warm and rootsy kind of sound Starts out great, but it takes a hard left near the middle, I think. Freaks in Love and I'm Thankful, I think, are awful, awful cheesy ballads that kind of wreck the record. Um, the latter, especially, I think, is a, is a real stain on an otherwise pretty good album. But like I said, it starts out strong. Porch Swing and Tupelo and Turn the Lights Out When You Leave, I think, are really strong songs. So this is where I go up to three and a half stars. Big jump there. We were in like one and a half territory like 30 seconds ago interesting okay uh my number 25 i got the big picture this is schlock but i think it's successful well done schlock this is post lion king so he's really laying on the can you feel the love tonight vibes and pretty much all the songs are trying to be can you feel the love tonight and i don't mind that i like uh, the lion king soundtrack i think that was good move for him so uh, I think it's decent. It's three stars for me. Uh, something about the way you look tonight is pretty good. Uh, 24, Peachtree Road. This one, uh, I don't know. His voice is so deep here, and it's tough. It's tough to take. It sounds, um, you know, pretty adult contemporary again. Like he's He's kind of stuck in that zone, although he kind of had gotten out of it. Uh, from Songs of the West Coast. This is sort of a step down. Starts off good and then just kind of goes down and, and down as it goes along. Uh, number 23, still in three-star territory, inching closer to three and a half. Uh, I have a single man. I think it's pretty bad compared to everything he had done before. I know Blue moves sort of like, okay, you can see the end coming. But I didn't think it would be so abrupt. Um, you know, he tries to do a lot more like piano and more acoustic piano stuff. And that's fine, but the songs are pretty lousy. Gary Osborne does the lyrics. 
uh, do a little Bernie for this one. And uh, they're pretty bad. Big Dipper is real, really bad. Um, I don't like Song for Guy much. The only song I really do like is not even on the album. Uh, bonus track, Ego, which is one of the few, one of the Bernie Toppin ones that he didn't use. Sounds exactly like Billy Joel, and I kind of like it. But everything else, just very mediocre and marks the end of the great period for Elton John. Number 22, Jump Up. You have Bernie Toppin back for like half the album, but they, they just don't have the right production, uh, the right sound. They, they, I mean, they're just a struggle throughout the 80s for Elton. Um, Dear John is okay, really relying on synths though. Um, the songs, I think, are a step up over some stuff, but not really because I have two albums immediately preceding this ahead of this one. So I think this is a, a step down into the bad period. Uh, Blue Eyes is pretty cheesy and uh, everyone seems to love Empty Garden, but I do not. Number 21, Breaking Hearts, 1984. So again, we're just, God, it's just so much 80s stuff, 80s and 90s. There's like a bad three, two and a half decade span for him. Where everything is just bland, 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 bland. Chris Thomas here to ruin the day with his production again, uh, despite having John Stone and Murray and Olson and Toppin. And, you know, I think they tried to go a little less pop than Too Low for Zero. But I don't know. Passengers is weak in neon. Just sounds like a dog contemporary. Bill uh, Burning Buildings, I think, is probably the best track on here. Nice ferocious chorus. Got some of that 70s magic. Davy Johnson's guitar uh, scorching a little bit. You got those nice backing vocals. But then Diddy Shooter sucks and Sad Songs Say So Much is cheesy, solid hook, though. Uh, it's got that hop skip beat that's very infectious. Still three stars, though. Still not in the three. Well, my 2.5 is kind of like Joe's three, just kind of like, eh, decent. And that's where I've got number 20, Songs from the West Coast. I know a lot of people love this one, but I just think it's decent. I don't think his voice is great on it. I think it needs some sort of effect and to be pushed back into the mix a little bit. But overall, the songs are more focused. Not without its faults. Uh, Hello, Bad, early 2000s production on Dark Diamond. Uh, but the piano is back for a good part on this album, which, which is a breath for fresh air. I think Look Ma, No Hands is good, but American Triangle is really dull. Birds and I Want Love harken back to the good old days. It's definitely an improvement on what he's doing, but still something I don't feel I need to revisit. Number 19, I've got The Captain and the Kid at 2.5, the straight-to-DVD sequel to the massive 1975 hit. Postcards from Richard Nixon. Nixon, one of my favorite presidents to hear songs about. Elton's voice sounds a little weathered by now, but it's still pretty good. And I don't like his voice up front in the mix so much. And that tends to be happening right around now. Doesn't naturally have the fire it once did. Uh, and I think that the playing is a bit sterile, except for that badass organ solo in Noah's Ark. You Any Other Way is pretty. I think that's where my appreciation kind of ends of this album. I think the album falls off a bit except for The Bridge, which is a very, very good song. It's close to three, but not quite. Number 18, another one that's very close to three and an album I want to like so much more. I've got Empty Sky, definitely admirable for a debut. Solid opener. I want the guitar turned up a little more here. It seems a bit limp. I like some of the more 60s psychedelic aspects that you don't get much else in this catalog. The arrangements are nice. Valhalla, really great harpsichord, maybe my favorite song on the album. But it doesn't have the passion you want or the memorable melodies that he'll come up with soon. Seems a bit restrained, still finding his voice. And all of this is fine for a debut. The Western Ford Gateway, I like that John Lennon-esque kind of vocals he does. Maybe a bit overthought on this record at times. I want big piano, big hooks. Hard to find things I dislike on here, but I just don't want to revisit it. Number 17, Regimental Sergeant Zippo, the found album from his mid-60s recording sessions. I thought this was pretty cool. Very close to three again. There's like Beatles influence in a lot of places, a more psychedelic sound, especially in the opener. Overall, not the direction that Elton would go most of the time, but incredibly fascinating stuff here. 
Um, his voice sounds even younger here than it does on like Empty Sky and on Elton John. Very enjoyable. These songs are good and pleasant and have a lot of like 60s kind of charm. The clock goes round is strong. There's some good bass grooving throughout. I think a song like Sitting Doing Nothing shows his youth, but also where he could go. It's a very good performance. I love the drums. Very Tommy Shondell's like guitar on Turn to Me. A Dandelion Dies in the Wind is very pretty. Just a really cool part of Elton's catalog. Number 16, I've got Wonderful Crazy Night. And we're finally at good albums. Albums I give a thumb up to and would like to revisit again. Three stars for Wonderful Crazy Night. I like In the Name of You. I like Clawhammer. I think this is the best marriage of arrangements and songwriting we've had maybe since the 70s. It feels like an Elton John production of the past. Big sweeping lifts in the chorus accompanied by accented out orchestral moves. And the songs are strong for the most part. I wish it had a bit more punch to it. It's still a bit soft, but he's older. Blue Wonderful is very touching. Tambourine and Free and Easy are also very good. It's a good record. Number three, we're, we got 16 good Elton John albums and obviously a lot of great ones to come. All right. <clears throat> Starting to get into some disagreements, which makes sense. I mean, that we the bad ones are pretty obviously bad and the good ones are pretty obviously good. It's here in the middle that it's kind of going to separate uh, our opinions. Uh, my number 20 is The Union the collaborative record with Leon Russell. I'm a little torn here because I don't love T-Bone's production, but I love Leon Russell. And I think the mutual admiration between him and Russell, I think it really comes through. It's it's like palpable. It's the best thing about the record. You can tell that they're enjoying playing together. Um, you've got an all-star lineup, Keltner, Don Waz, Mark Rabot, Doyle Bramhall, Robert Randolph, Brian Wilson, Neil Young, Jason Sheff, Booker T. Jones. So a lot of great players. Not a lot of the record blows me away, but I, I, I like I said, I kind of just like hearing the camaraderie and I love Leon Russell's voice. Um, and I, I like having the Elton tunes broken up by someone else singing, especially someone as good as Leon. It's kind of what you would expect from a T-Bone Burnett production. It's kind of rustic, earthy, a little muffled sounding, uh, but still overall pretty enjoyable. Three and a half stars. My number 19 is Regimental Sergeant Zippo, which, as Cram just talked about, is the archival release. Came out on Record Store Day a few years ago, uh, predating his actual first record. Uh, and as the title of the record and the album cover leads you to believe, this is a very psychedelic affair. Quite a bit of Beatles worship going on. His voice is really high and so high, in fact, that I ha have to believe that at least on a few of these tracks that the tape is sped up because it sounds uh, a little unbelievable that it would be that high. You know, I don't think the songs are necessarily great, but I really like this style of music. And I think, you know, it's just an easy listen. And chronologically, I listen to it at the end uh, rather than first. So it kind of broke up things and gave some relief. So I like Turn to Me, the title track, uh, You'll Be Sorry to See Me Go, I think are pretty solid tracks. And I think probably the right move not debuting with it. I think it would have gotten lost in the shuffle of all of the other psychedelic stuff coming out in uh, 67. So uh, three and a half stars, good record, but not great. Uh, my number 18 is The Captain and the Kid, the sequel to Captain Fantastic. No physical singles were released from this record, which is a little odd. This is his third record in a row in this kind of comfortable later stage, which is like really focused on songwriting and the natural production and less pop centric than a lot of stuff that he had been doing. And I think it's all the better for it. I probably underrated it a little bit last time. I had it at number 20. I only have it two spots higher, but uh, I, I think I feel more strongly about it now than I did then for sure. I think it hangs together nicely as a full album listen, even though there's not a ton of standout tracks here. I, I like the kind of autobiographical element to it. I think that really helps the listening. Uh, have that at three and a half stars as well. My number 17 is Friends, the soundtrack record from 1971. I didn't count this in my original list. This was actually a new listen for me. Never listened to it before. It sounds like a lot of the other classic albums from this era, sound-wise, sonically. And there's some good songs on it. Friends, Honey Roll, and Can I Put You On, I think, are all pretty good. It's just, like Joe said, padded with too much other stuff, instrumental type of things to be really a great album. But some definitely worthwhile tracks here. And then my number 16, perhaps controversially, I've got Blue Moves. Um, this was Elton's second double album. Uh, the first one that he released on his own label, uh, Rocket Records, I think it was called. Unlike Yellow Brick Road, though, I don't think there's much of an argument to be made here that like I, this is too long. I don't think there's any denying it. I think it's too much music uh, for 
the quality of the music that it is. It's kind of a shame because there are there's some good stuff here. I think Chameleon's really good. Cage the Songbird. If there's a God in Heaven, sorry, seems to be the hardest word. I like the Proggy Jam on Out of the Blue. And even the other stuff is not that bad. I don't think there's anything like really bad on it. But to make a double album, like the longer it gets, the exponentially better the songs have to be in it. They're just not that great level to justify a double album for me. Um, so three and a half stars for Blue Moves. Your bulldog is barking in the backyard, huh, Jason? Um, my number 20, it's a it's a lyric. Number 20, I got Empty Sky. I just, I'm, it's not the Elton that I want to hear. And he's, you know, he's he's finding his voice here. And it's fine. It's good that they didn't release it as his debut because it, it's just not great. Like it's it's a mediocre album that doesn't show off enough of what he can do and what him and Poppin are all about. And um, you know, there's no amazing production from Gus Dudgeon. So it's 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 like a little footnote. It it's irrelevant. I saw some people putting it like way high on the lists. It's kooky talk. Uh 19, I got the Fox. And um, you know, you can kind of see him going down the path of the 80s cheese, adult contemporary, bad production. Uh Chris Thomas again on the boards. Uh definitely sounds less organic. And um, you know, some of these songs were leftovers from 21 at 33 sessions. So you have uh D. Murray, and Nigel Olson uh back for about half the album. And, you know, Bring Down Berries is not bad. I like this uh, strong female backing vocals, touch of R&B, a rollicking 50s piano style. Unfortunately, it sounds like the 80s now, so it doesn't quite work. And I, I don't love the, the uh, you know, production on his vocals very much. A little buried. I mean, it it kind of sounds like bloated, so maybe he was still doing a lot of cocaine at this time. And, um, you know, Carla Etude, Etude, you know, it's no funeral for a friend, and um, it, it's decent. Elton's song, I think, is a, a pretty darn good song, and then everything else is just okay. James Newton Howard, who I liked at first, kind of getting uh, too big for his britches, taking over too much of the sound, so uh, not great, but I'm gonna go three and a half stars for that one. Uh, number 18, I got Wonderful Crazy Night, which I, I didn't really care for it much in 2016 when I heard it. But listening with fresh tears, I think it's it's pretty good. Um, I like the, it sounds natural to me for the most part. A lot of acoustic piano. I think Elton's playing really well. I think the, the songs and the sounds and the production are all good. Um, Elton sounds a little haggard, but um it, it's pretty decent it's just a decent to good to slightly good album i don't know it's three and a half but i don't know if i'd really go back to it that much uh number 17 the diving board elton's got like the booming disney voice at this point like full on and it's it's tough to take because i think the band on here sounds pretty good they got Raphael sadiq on bass which is pretty cool uh t-bone Burnett producing it's one of those back to basics records that at some point everybody does and Elton does it here. Uh, I think a town called Jubilee is pretty good, fun and funky, uh, the ballad of blind Tom dark and foreboding. And, you know, maybe not the strongest melodies or catchiest songs, but I like the way everything sounds here. Um, so three and a half stars there. Number 16, uh, Captain and the Kids, sequel to Captain Fantastic. Straight to DVD, I love that. It's maybe the best thing you've ever said. Um, this is, to me, I don't know if it's straight to DVD. This might be like a streaming on you know HBO Max kind of release. I think it's pretty solid. It lacks like the killer tunes, obviously. And it it's hard. I mean, if you're going to call something the Captain and the Kid, you're obviously going to be in the shadow of... An album that I think we all think is pretty dang good and that a lot of people consider his finest work. But, um, you know, it's good. It's a good sounding album. And I like sort of the, you know, the instrumentation 
and the style going back to that you know almost like tumbleweed connection like western romantic kind of stuff uh i think works well all right all right let's do the last five before the top 10 all good albums number 15 i've got the union i like t-burn t-bone burnett as a producer more than jason does but i do think he's a bit overrated by his stands but here the more it reminds you of the 70s stuff the better and it does that it's not amazing but it's solid i think that's kind of the big problem with his post 70s stuff is at times it's perfectly good but nothing like wows you almost ever uh you know t-bone's bringing more of a rootsy feel to it it's got that honky tonk kind of record sounds like a mix of tumbleweed and honky chateau a little bit but neither is good some killer piano and actual attitude on the playing again like in hey ahab i think it's too long it almost suffers too much from it i almost knocked it down to 2.5 but some moments on it are really good i really like the feel of jimmy rogers dream i like the steel pedal guitar on it i love the country shuffle on a dream come true and i love the vocals so effortless and soft-spoken by both uh, singers there's a more natural folk and storyteller style very impressive it's a good album number 14 one i never heard before i've got the diving board uh or as i call it the album cover that looks like the movie poster to apocalyptico if i or apocalypto if i don't have my glasses on it's a very emotional album i think he sings better on here than anything he did in a while town called jubilee is very very good i think there's some very good material but the album is way too long it needs to be about five songs shorter but it has some great piano stuff memorable piano stuff for the first time in a long time i really like the work on the ballad of the blind tom lots of intriguing feelings and moods on here that aren't really on any of his best stuff like dream number one a little bit more melancholic and surreal in nature at times with the compositions my quicksand is kind of like that Home Again, I think, is really unique. He's got just like a different style of piano playing and composing. There's a lot of melodrama, and it works. It's a good album. Rolling Stone had it in its top 25 for 2013, which is a bit uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but that's Rolling Stone for you. Number 13, I've got two low for zero, three stars. Bit of a return to form from just writing good songs, simplifying and not trying to be something he's not. Cold as Christmas is nice. I'm Still Standing is kind of the big 80s pop hit he wanted for a while. Uh, I guess that's why they call it the blues is great. Title track is pretty cool sounding to me. I do, you know, think they do their 80s affection right here. Some stuff I think is still not great, like Religion. But Crystal is solid, and Whipping Boy is the hidden gem on the album to me. Number 12, here's where I got Blue Moves. Three stars. I don't think it's really good. I just think it's good. Uh, love the instrumentation and the arrangements, especially the rhythm section on the opening piece, but the album is just too damn long and bloated, and it's not just like a complaint, it's a fact. We say it a lot, Some here, somewhere in here is a good album, or a great album, I think it's a good album, but what could have been with just the right sequencing and cutting? One Horse Town is good. Some of the moodier and introspective sensations on the album seem a bit forced at times over the top, like the production on Tonight. You know, by now, some of the parts and compositions are, and moments are a little bit too familiar. It still has good stuff, though. I'm just nitpicking. It's still a really good listen. Number 11, I've got A Single Man, and I'm not talking about the 2009 Colin Firth film, which is excellent, but the 1978 release here. This is the first one without Bernie, and you can tell... But I do like some aspects of it a lot. The back to basics approach, there's production on it, but not nearly as much. It's more so a man with his piano kind of album. And overall, I think the songs are nice and relaxed and satisfying. They lack some of the complexity of his overthought stuff leading up to this. And everything's just pleasant. Return to Paradise is sweet. There are some duds. I'm with Joe. Big Dipper is really kind of almost embarrassing that he was like proud to put that out. It Ain't Gonna Be Easy is nice. It's obvious there's something missing on this album, but Elton's charisma, piano playing, and melody writing is here, and that is enough to get a good record because that's his strength and his attributes. It's not going to reach the height of his potential, but it's a good album. I kind of like Shooting Star. It's a weird soft ballad, and I think Song for a Guy is good. So just outside the top ten, a single man. Three stars. 
All right. Uh, my next couple are records that I think actually I might have had higher last time, but they've dropped a little bit, but I still like them a decent amount. I think they're pretty good records. Number 15 is The Fox. Maybe Alton's most forgotten album. It's one of his worst selling albums, but I like it. Despite five of the tracks being recorded during the 21 at 33 sessions, Murray and Olsen are back on all the Chris Thomas produced stuff. Um, plus, you've got a few songs here written with Toppin again. Uh, just like Belgium, I think is great. All the singles actually are really good, especially Chloe, which I think is phenomenal and shockingly comes from the earlier sessions. It does have that early 80s sound, but it, it's far less polite than 21 at 33. I think there's some actually interesting playing on this record. The songs are better, less generic, less predictable. Not an amazing album, but I think it's worth seeking out, and it's got a few really hidden gems on it, I think. So three and a half stars for The Fox. Uh, my number 14 is Made in England, which has has dropped a little. I had it in my top 10 before. Um, so it's fallen a bit, but Joe, I think, had it way too low. I, I think, you know, finally, he he starts to dig out of that rut that he was in, albeit briefly. Nothing fancy here. I think it's just good songs with appropriate production. Paul Buckmaster's back, which is really nice. The strings on it are really great. You get a cool French horn arrangement from George Martin on a track. I think Believe is a great opener. The record kind of reminds me of uh, McCartney's 90, 90s resurgence with Flaming Pie, and Greg Penny's production reminds me a lot of like Jeff Lynn's 90s production style. I think it's really consistent. I don't think there's anything really bad here. My favorite tracks are Believe, Latitude, and Please. Number 13 is a record that I think I like more than most people, but I don't know. I dig it. Jump Up from 1982. Uh, Bernie Toppin called it awful and disposable aside from Empty Garden. And while it's not great I, there's definitely more to it than empty garden and it's definitely better than everything pretty much that came after it in the 80s uh blue eyes i think is is really cool elton's doing kind of like this elvis-esque vocal i love the cheesiness of i am your robot i think it's so catchy just a relentless hook on that one ball and chain i like um it was the third single i think it's a pretty fun song all quiet on the rest western front is a decent ballad works well as the closer i like princess a lot too um, I think it's one of his most consistent albums of the 80s. It's pr pretty good. I like it. Uh, number. You like Jump Up because it's like his Elvis Costello album. Is it? Sure. Because I said so. Well, if that's true, then yes, that's why. Number 12, another one that dropped out of my top 10. I've got songs from the West Coast, but still, even though it's out of my top 10, I think it's his most convincing return to his 70s sound since the 70s. Uh, the material, not quite as strong as it was then, but it's definitely good. It's warm. It was recorded to tape. Definitely the deepening of his voice with aging is becoming more apparent, but I don't think it's really a detriment here as it would become later on records like The Diving Board. Uh, and like I said, not quite as high on it as I once was, but still very good. Still probably my favorite late period Elton record. My number 11, just missing out on the top 10. I've got Rock of the Westies. Um, from 1975. Elton fired Murray and Olsen right prior to the recording it. He's got Roger Pope on it and Kenny Passarelli, who are who are serviceable. I think they're good, but they're not quite uh, Murray and Olsen. Um, this is generally considered the last record of his classic period, and I'd argue maybe it's the first one not in his classic period. I think it's pretty good, but it's also a pretty clear step down from pretty much everything up to this point. I do like Yell, uh, Yell Help, Wednesday Night Ugly, that little suite that opens the record. But then after that, there's there's a stretch of songs that I don't care for much. Dan Dare, I think, not working. There's too much like wah and flange and talk box stuff going on. It's kind of silly. I'm not that high on Island Girl and Grow Some Funk of Your Own. I think those three songs, I don't know, they're, they're kind of like everything that isn't good about the 70s it's just like all the decadence and cheese of that decade crammed into three songs and uh, not crazy about it does bounce back with i feel like a bullet which i think is great feed me is really cool it's kind of like steely dan-esque elton john uh but i think my favorite two songs from this era are the two that aren't on the record they're the bonus cuts plain and sugar on the floor which was a b-side i think those are exceptional songs i think the record probably could have been a bit better, but uh, sticking at number 11. 
Well, I can't think of what hasn't come yet for you. Empty sky, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, but other than that, we're pretty close to the same top tens. My number 15 is going to be Regimental Sergeant Zippo, which I think is pretty good. I think it's a lot better than Empty Sky, even though it's you know clearly Beatles worship, psychedelia. Uh, but I think it sounds pretty cool. I think the songwriting's better than it was on Empty Sky. And I just like the sound in general of this style. And I think he does it pretty good. Um, I think this could have been a decent first album. But then again, you know, then you kind of get pigeonholed as a psychedelic Beatles you know, worshiper. But yeah, you can break out of that. The Bee Gees kind of do the same thing. So uh and the clock goes round. I think it's probably my favorite on here. Dandelion dies in the wind. But pretty cool psychedelia stuff. Uh, number 14. Finally getting to four stars here with the Union. Uh, I think Leon Russell's presence just does a world of good because it's not all Elton. And at this point, I don't know if Elton can carry a 65 you know, minute album. But Elton and Leon, absolutely. Uh, you got a murderer's row of guest musicians. Uh, Neil Young pops in for some really nice vocals on Gone to Shiloh, which is probably the favorite, my favorite thing he's done in 30 to 40 years. Uh, you got Brian Wilson doing some backing vocals and arrangement. Don Was, Robert Randolph, Booker T. Jones. Uh, it's just, you know, guest star after guest star. Um, and the songs, you get that. 70s tumbleweed connection you got some of that boogie that honky tonk uh as well and the you know the instrumentation is just great the, some pedal steel acoustic bass there's dulcimer and uh you know b3 organ from booker t jones and you got horns and everything and it's just lively the songs are better production's a little murky i wish it was a little clearer um but you know you can't argue with it too much i think it was a, a really nice uh, late period kind of renaissance for them number 13 i'm gonna go with 21 at 33 which is named because it's his 21st album at only 33 years old which is insane uh i mean good lord that's a lot of albums in uh, about 10 years 10 12 years it's, it's pretty nuts um 14 studio albums that's not like he was releasing four albums every year but he brings back the old bandmates bernie Taupin comes back um steve luke a third takes over lead guitar and yeah you, you gotta get that studio sound um and less personality but i think the songs are um, much improved over victim of love and you know the peak pretty much the peak of his 80s um I think sartorial eloquence is good two rooms at the end of the world solid white lady white powder got the eagle singing backing vocals and it, it's yeah it's great a little on the nose uh singing about like cocaine and stuff but it's all right uh dear god i uh, really like the gospel feel you got tony tenniel and a choir backing up elton there bruce johnson from the beach boys does the arrangements which is cool yeah, his voice sounds a little odd. He's I don't know if he's losing it already or the cocaine kind of caught up to him, but I think the songs on there are pretty darn good. Number 12, songs from the West Coast. Uh, the peak of his you know late renaissance after he ditched Chris Thomas. Um, finally sounding good again. And it's not just the sound that's better, and the sound is light years better than the 90s, 80s production. We haven't had you know production this good since uh, Blue Moves, maybe. I mean, uh, everything sounds great. The acoustic piano sounds amazing. And the songs are fantastic. I mean, American Triangle is really good. Uh, this Train Don't Stop Here. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. American Triangle is fantastic. Rufus Wainwright on backing vocals. This Train Don't Stop Here anymore. If, like, 70s Elton had done it, I would have fit right into his catalog. I think it's amazing. I Want Love, another incredibly well-written song. Uh, he doesn't quite sing it as well as you know, Chris Stapleton does a great cover of it. 
and his voice is you know fading a little bit but overall uh, i think the the songs and the playing on this album are really darn good and then finally top 10 what's it going to be one is going to mess it here i got blue moves just missing out at number 11 uh you know only elton would dare release another double album three years after another double album a year after releasing two single albums I mean, this guy's just full of songs and a lot of these songs are really good it's just too many of them um it's all over the place like there's no coherence at all and it's just it's just too much like there's some really great songs i love chameleon i think one horse town is great great guitar sound still got davy johnson on it crazy waters kind of like this beach boys pastiche Sorry seems to be the hardest word, really harkens to his like 80s pop stuff. Out of the Blue is a really cool, like proggy instrumental. Between 17 and 20 is great. Um, Idol's great. It's just, there's too many, too many of them. And they all are like slightly off his best work. So, you, you know, the end is here. This is really the last, um, you know, of his classic sound that you're really going to want to hear. Everything after this, save for one little thing in the 80s. Not quite the same. Pick it back up in the 2000s. But uh, Blue Moves, better than I, I remember it being. So four stars for that one. All right. I'm going to start the top 10 defending my slight distaste for this album that everyone else loves. And I've always kind of find it, found it to be a bit overrated. And I only have it at 3.5, which on my scale is very good. Almost great. I've got Caribou at number 10. I don't think it's quite as good as everyone else does. It opens with The Bitch is Back, which is one of the most underrated album openers of all time. I think it's badass. I kind of call this his Who album. I get Pete Townsend vibes with like the songwriting and the guitar parts all over this album. There's lots of great backing vocals. You get Dusty Springfield, Carl Wilson. Pinky is really good. There's not a bad moment on it, but I think what keeps it from being great is it doesn't have some of the drama that I want on his stuff. I feel like there's something missing, maybe a bit too poppy at times for me. Like all the songs are solid. Grimsby is solid. Dixie Lily is good. There's just like almost like this vapid void of emotion, like this snobbery, like self-indulgence. Like I can write just these melodies and ditties and they're going to be hits because I'm that talented. And they are like, they're very talented songs, but they just kind of roll along and assume their own greatness. And there's not a lot of stuff that communicates to me as a listener. I still really like listening to it. And maybe it's a bit too playful for me at times not to be taken seriously enough, but you know, there's a lot of great songs. The ones that I named are great. Don't let the sun go down on me is great though. Like I don't want any of these songs to disappear. I want, most of them to show up on his greatest hits collections and be a part of his set list. But for some reason, start to fish, start to fish, start to finish. It doesn't leave me with like the same impressed feeling that his other stuff from the seventies do. That said, I still really like it a lot. 3.5. There's just something about it that doesn't get it in that upper echelon for me. So caribou, my number 10. I uh, I don't think you're actually alone in that. I think most people put it at like the bottom of his classic period. I just happen to like it more than most people. But we will get to that later. My number 10 is my, my 10 and nine are the two records I think that climbed my rankings the most uh, from the last video that I did. Number 10, I'm going to Empty Sky, which... I think I think when people rate it, they I think it suffers from being just before all these other classic records. And so it feels worse than it is. But I think if you actually take Empty Sky and compare it to later records, I think it stands up pretty well. I think it's easily better than the majority of everything else that came uh, after the classic period. So I think it's really so solid. I think it's actually a pretty small step away from the classic period. Obviously, like Joe said, he's still finding his voice and it's not entirely like put together. He hasn't entirely found his artistic voice yet, but still really good. Um, I like the touches of folk and psych and like the Baroque elements in there. And 
Skyline Pigeon, I think is really good. Valhalla is, is really strong. I like the title track a lot. And, you know, I, I'm not even really sure what it is that isn't there yet. Um, I think maybe it's that the arrangements don't feel quite as considered yet. Kind of just like these are the songs and we've got these studio players and they'll do their thing and that, that'll be the arrangement. And later on, you know, they'd, they'd really tear apart all the parts and every person is playing the exact perfect thing for the song but other than that the songwriting's good his voice is good uh, i like it i think it's a strong record uh still three and a half we're getting close to uh well, where, where am i i don't know my my ratings are all off um because i changed them and i shuffled things around so don't listen to my stars i think i have it at uh i don't know i don't know what it's three and a half I you're think. not in the four stars by the top 10 not counting Cramsers goofy rating system something wrong with you i'll put okay. i'll put my i'll put my um, stars at the end so that people know what they're actually you just called my rating system goofy but you gave something 3.5 earlier and went it's okay it's kind of good it's pretty good it's good like shut up dude i'm so over it i get so much five, shit but at least mine, <laughs> mine are defined and you give 92 percent of your ratings are 3.5 it makes no sense i will hear none of it Elite, do you have the same rating system as Jason? And somehow Jason's makes infinite more sense than yours does. Like, it baffles me. That's because I like everything, but don't like everything because it's all the same. Mine is fine. I just got the numbers screwed up on my paper because I was moving my notes all around. So uh, there's nothing wrong with my ranking system. I'm just telling you the wrong scores. Your Elton John scores are wrong. That's what I'm saying. My number 10. You got too low for zero. And yeah, listen, everyone, although a lot of people I, I've seen in our Discord, which you can join, become a patron, um, they have this one really low, too low, if you ask me. Because uh, I think the songs and the melodies are just way, way better than any of his other 80s stuff. Uh, I love Cold as Christmas. It's got some devastating lyrics from Pop and a really weird like juxtaposition you have like him calling his kids and the narration is weird and he's talking about his wife and there's always this you know fire and ice and tropics and the cold and it, it's just a really kind of cool uh way to frame like a failed marriage um and you got some really great backing vocals from uh murray and olsen who are back uh you got david johnstone also back uh you got Ray Cooper still there. Kiki D comes back for some uh, backing vocals as well. And, you know, this is the beginning. I think it's the beginning of the Chris Thomas period. So the productions, it's too icy. It's too 80s. I think it would have been better with some real, you know, a good producer. Um, you know, he kind of murders Nigel Olson's drum sound, which is one of the greatest drum sounds of all time in the 70s. And now it's just kind of stereotypical 80s stuff. But the songs, my favorite since Rock of the Westies. I don't know how Jason hates I'm Still Standing. It's unhateable. It's just a really catchy, you know, little song. Elton's back and he's still standing. It's great. You could drink those backing vocals with a straw. Um, Religion might be the, the worst track on the album. It's got like this rockabilly metal guitar and like a really 80s sound. It's just, it just doesn't quite work. But I love, I guess that's why they call it the blues. Um, just a killer, killer written and you know, melody. Stevie Wonder's got a great little harmonica solo. Crystal has like dated synth sounds, but I think it's kind of cool sounding, interesting, uh, way different than anything Elton had done before. And I, I love Kiss the Bride. Like that's what does it for me. Like I got Cold as Christmas. Guess what? That's why they call it the blues. I'm still standing. You got Kiss the Bride as a fourth single. It's just a fun, like, popcorn pop song. Got some funky bass on there, a great forward beat. And the, the lyrics, again, are, like, really mean and kind of, like, dark. Um, dark in a really fun, poppy song from Toppin. So I think it, it's pretty good. And I just think it's a very enjoyable album. And it's better on the songwriting front, despite the production issues. That placement is too high for too low for zero. Yeah, that placement's a little bit too high for me. Uh, earlier, Jason said that he thinks Toppin is one of the more overrated lyricists. 
I don't think he is. I think he has moments of greatness. He's just pretty inconsistent. All right, my number nine is Caribou Overrated, Rock of the Westies Underrated, mainly because John Stone's guitar is just on fire here. He's firing her way on the opener and the medley. Dan Dare is good. I think by this time in the catalog, though, the sounds and the styles and the themes and the compositions are getting a bit exhausted and some repetition. So this album does a good job of flirting with some of its arrangements and production. There's some cool stuff. It's not just like the heavy strings and all that. Island Girl is pretty damn good. I think it's very cool. I think there's just a bunch of underrated songs. Uh, Grow Some Funk of Your Own is pretty cool. And I absolutely love Street Kids. I think that's one of Johnstone's better guitar licks. It's so badass with the you know, shake and bake of the percussion in the back. It's a bit of a simple album. Certainly most of the songs don't live up to just the unprecedented streak it was on previously, but I still think it's a really good rock record. So my number nine, 3.5, Rock of the Westies. I feel worse about your caribou placement after realizing you have Westies ahead of it. Uh, my number nine is A Single Man, which uh, this is a record that grew on me a lot through this listening I like it a lot more now than I ever did. Uh, it's the first without Toppin, which you've both said, and it's the first with uh, first since the debut, since Empty Sky, without Gus Dudgeon producing. It does have a very like particular late seventies ness to it, but much better melodies and and more memorable songs, I think, than. Um, Blue Moves had. I Don't Care starts kind of cheesy, but then it has that like great guitar hook that comes in in the chorus. And that's kind of like a lot of what this album is like for me. It like walks up to the line of being sort of lame and cheesy, but there's always something that hooks me in. And then I go like, okay, actually, this is like pretty good. Uh, Shine through, Shine On Through, I think is cool. It's got great vocals on it. I actually kind of like Big Dipper even. I, I kind of reminds me of Dr. John. Uh, it Ain't Gonna Be Easy, I think is really cool and haunting. It's kind of moody. Got some really great guitar work on it. Part-Time Love, I think, is a pure pop confection. Georgia's got this kind of like great Southern gospel country thing going on. Doesn't match the top eight. Not really even close. I think, you know, the top eight are in a class to themselves. But I like it quite a bit. I think it's pretty underrated. I don't really have a problem with any of the songs on it. I think it's a pretty solid record. Single Man, number nine. Uh, my number nine is going to be an album grew on me the most of anything this this session this discography and i always i don't know why i guess daniel is the reason i didn't like don't shoot me i'm only the piano player cram is a gog um but i always i always hated daniel like i hear those kind of cheesy calypso and i'm just like boop, boop, change the channel now, you know, after repeated lessons, I've probably listened to this album 10, 15 times in the past month. Um, really grown on me. Even Daniel, I don't mind. I don't think it's a good opener, but it doesn't kill it for me. Like, I, I guess it always had. I always just like skipped over this one because 73, you got Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Why do I need to listen to this? But, um, and while it is a step down from Honky, uh, it has some really cool, interesting, charming songs. Teacher, I Need You, kind of like ABBA. Uh, got big pop piano sound. Uh, reminds me of When I Kiss the Teacher by ABBA a little bit. Um, and I, I love his piano playing here. It's got that fast, syncopated 50s piano sound. Those big fluid, um, big chord, big chords and the fluid changes. Playful, melodic. Um, I think the... Other than Daniel, Midnight Creeper doesn't quite work as a Stones homage, but I really like Paul Buckmaster, who comes back for um, some songs, some orchestral arrangements, Blues for Baby and Me, uh, Have Mercy on the Criminal, just like these big epics. Elton sounds great. Be a Teenage Idol has some glam in it. Crocodile Rocks got that great throwback 50s sound and some really good playing from John Stone on guitar. High Flying Bird, really Van Morrison channeling there. And, well, the songs, I think, aren't quite as memorable as the greatness around him um, from the albums, uh, Honky Chateau and uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. I think it's a really good album, and it's 70s Elton John. The band 
it just sounds amazing. The production's amazing. The drum sounds, the backing vocals, it's all there. It's a little, little all over the place, kind of like by Yellow Brick Reds. It's kind of like a stepping stone for that. But um, I don't know, maybe because I hadn't listened to it as much, it really sounded fresh and new. And like I just wanted to listen to these songs more because I haven't heard them eight bajillion times. Um, so for now, it's it's a high four star uh, for Don't Shoot Me. I'm on the piano player. Number eight for me, I've got it four stars, which is great on my scale. So Jason's right. There is like a, you know, a considered eight great Elton albums. But I switch out Caribou for this underrated gem. I've got Friends, which I think is a great album. You guys are laughing, but you're, you know, Joe's the one that's like, oh, I love, you know, I'm the classical music guy. But anytime there's like three minutes of instrumentation, he's like, nope, not interested. Um, you know, if you didn't say this was from a movie, you would just be like, wow, he really dipped into his, you know, symphonic side, which is some beautiful compositions. And that's what we have here. Just gorgeous sounding music. End of story. And it's not like it's overwhelming. There are plenty of lyrics and singing and like song styles on this album. It is not just like some, you know, there's not filler. Everything is a suite or a piece or a movement when it's not just a full out song. The title track is great. I love the trumpet in it. I think it's a trumpet. It might be French horn. I think Honey Roll is really good. I like the charming rock side of it. It's another thing that's cool about this album. It's not just string music. He like throws in other stuff. Um, and it's just all beautiful. The reeds and the acoustic guitar on the theme are just tremendous. Everything is so pretty and heartwarming. I think the the I think the season's theme itself is incredibly beautiful. I remember it from an episode of The Wonder Years, um, which is just fantastic. It tears me up. And it's got that lovely line. It's funny how young lovers start as friends. Everything's just so touching. It all hits the right notes, the right emotions. I just like the dynamic of Elton John focusing on compositions to capture moments. I think he knocks it out of the park. There's not a note that doesn't have something to say. Everything conveys so much. Can I Put You On is really good. It picks up steam for the album. Michelle's song is wonderful. I honestly don't understand why this is considered such an outlier. I've seen it on some lists in like the bottom five. And like I said, it's not even overwhelming with the instrumentation. There's a lot of strings and stuff at times, but it's great. Friends, number eight, four stars. It's a great album. My number eight is a record that this album's Wikipedia page calls Elton John's first progressive rock album. I don't know about that. It's Madman Across the Water. Olsen and Murray kind of floating around at this time. They only play together on all the nasties. Uh, apparently at this time, Gus Dudgeon didn't trust their ability in the studio yet. So I don't know. Hard to imagine that they were so much worse than they became that they wouldn't be reliable on a record. Uh, but who am I to doubt Gus Dudgeon? Without a doubt, some great songs on this record. Tiny Dancer, obviously great. Leave On, Razor Face. Uh, so... I don't know exactly what it is that makes this like one of the weaker classic records for me. Uh, I think maybe it's something about the arrangements or like the songs don't feel super distinct from one another. And as an album, it kind of kind of bleeds together, especially in the back half. And I think on the heels of like the similarly arranged Tumbleweed Connection, it's just like more of the same. And it feels a little like Elton's just like repeating himself over and over. Every song feels like, uh, the same like another version of the same song so it's great i really like it i've got it at four stars but from the classic period one of my lesser favorites uh madman across the water i get it i get it um my number eight is gonna be the self-titled 1970 the beginning of one of the hottest greatest streets in music history if you ask me uh First of two albums in 1970, just the, the factory that was Bernie Toppin and Elton John just cranking out these incredible songs, these amazing albums. Um, and you, I mean, forget bit, you know, Empty Sky and Regimental, Sergeant Zippo, like this is the sound of Elton John. Like it's all here. Um, you know, Elton's just bashing away on piano, able to meld like this classical streak. I mean, he's an unbelievable 
piano player. His piano parts are some of my, he's my favorite rock and roll pianist of all time, bar none. And his work is incredible. It's, you know, classically influenced, but also has the energy of like 50 stars, like Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard. Um, and you, you all, you get this all on this album. You get the strings from Paul Buckmaster in there. You got this weird penchant for like country Western, um, which I don't know if it, that came from Toppin, um, but like that instrumentation, like the feel, the romanticism of the old American West. Uh, you got these big celebratory choruses all over the place. And, the, you know, it's something completely new and interesting in the pop genre. And I think, you know, after the Beatles left, broke up, Elton John is, you know, the best, the next best great, you know, pop songwriter from 70 to 75. Nobody could even touch him. And a lot of it, you know, Toppin and the band and the production from Gus Dudgeon, which is amazing. For me, you know, Beatles leave. Elton John steps right in. He's the king of the pop song. Take Me to the Pilot's great. Um, your song, the complexity in the lyrics and the music already is incredible. Uh, it gets a little soppy with uh, first episode at Heinton and 60 Years On and The Greatest Discovery, but you know, he, he's still kind of finding the balance. And it comes roaring back with the cage, which is really cool. It's got like this R&B leaning and then this arp or, or synth comes in. It's almost like proggy in the middle. Uh, and the, the King Must Die, great big epic closer. So, you know, the sound's there, everything's there, the production's there, the playing. It, it's all here, and he would only get better. But, uh, you know, it's a hell of a debut for Elton John and Bernie. Yeah, let's keep talking about it. It's my number seven. I got it at four stars. The strength of starting the album with your song alone just puts it to me at 3.5. It's already a very good album and it can't be any lower. The rest of the album could be Victim of Love with Johnny Be Good on it. And it's still going to be a must have album because your song is one of the greatest songs of all time. Uh, Take Me to the Pilot shows off his fun rock and roll sign. Yeah, everything. Joe had a great review of it. I don't have much else to add. It's that just amazing how quickly he found himself as an artist, just like, you know, recorded, you know, the mid 60s stuff and empty sky. And then was like, Oh wait, no, here it is. Boom. Tremendous. Like it still needs tinkered with a little bit. Well, yeah. First episode's a little too soft, uh, but no shoes, no strings, getting some of that Americana Western flavor. It's not just like he found himself as a singer songwriter and like how to perform it, but he's still like putting in a little bit of Americana classical, rock and roll like putting in a little bit of everything and the marriage of the production and the songs is perfect everything is really poised great greatest discovery is wonderful border song is wonderful it's just such a huge leap from you know just a couple years ago highlighting his attributes and still a sign of things to come just really remarkable just four stars it's great elton john number seven all right, that is my number seven as well. Really strong record, really warm, full and lush, tighter, more focused songwriting than Empty Sky. And the Buckmaster string arrangements are amazing. Uh, some of the best string arrangements of all time for pop songs, I think. Elton's voice is sounding really full and strong. A big leap in his vocal performance between Empty Sky and this, uh, especially strong on like Take Me to the Pilot. Really good. Probably his most pure kind of like singer songwriter album has that very early 70s feel. It's almost like a British version of the Laurel Canyon sound in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, you guys said it all already. It's just a, a really good. I like all the Baroque elements and, and especially the string arrangements are just gorgeous. So yeah, four stars, Elton John. All right. Uh, Jason had Madman, maybe lower than most, or you know, maybe his review wasn't quite as sterling as someone like but i get his hesitation for this one uh because while tiny dancer and levon are just perfection like just from heaven to elton john and bernie top to us some of the, the best songs of all time uh, it's a little inconsistent razor face is a little anonymous i love the guitar on Mammon Across That Water, that acoustic way it opens, the 
um, harmonics, uh, that little like section in the middle, the bridge where it fades away and the, the orchestration comes in. Really cool, awesome song. Side two, Indian Sunset. No. Uh, kind of ham fisted attempt at like, you know, the plight of the, the Indian, but it doesn't it doesn't quite work. Toppin kind of stumbles with those lyrics and uh, it's it's a little much. Uh, Holiday Inn is fun. Uh, Rotten Peaches is fun. All all the nasties, they're, they're fun songs. They're good, but I don't know. They're kind of anonymous. They kind of feel like you know border song and take me to the pilot. It's kind of part two, a little bit of like um, um, country comfort maybe sneaking in a little bit of that tumbleweed connection, and they just don't feel like fresh or a new direction. Kind of feels like leftovers. Um, not that they're bad songs. I, I I like this album a lot. It's four and a half stars, but it's tough, you know, when you open with Tiny Dancer and leave on, like everything after that is like, where are you going to go with this? Like it's, it's struggling a little bit to keep up with those. And, you know, Buckmaster is still there and it isn't breaking new ground. So it kind of feels maybe like, you know, he's on a treadmill a little bit, but the minor criticisms because I love this album and you know it's it's four and a half stars it's fantastic my, my number six and I'm up to 4.5 really great I've got don't shoot me I'm only the piano player uh I like the more relaxed you know Caribbean calypso kind of feel of Daniel teacher I need you with that roaring piano part is a great follow-up I feel like this is very much like Elton John the self-titled but just better and a bit more polished and it has just like a kind of a straight up piano rock feel to me. Like he is just crushing it on the keys here. Almost like his versions of certain songs harkening back to like Jerry Lee Lewis with just kind of that mystique, just being like me, piano, like everything all these rock bands are doing with guitars and drums. I can do it with just my fingertips. Like, boom, he makes it happen. The drums are pretty straightforward on this album. Everything steams ahead for the most part. Every song is like screaming to be a big crowd pleaser during live performances and certainly are. The album's kind of rowdy, just a lot of fun. But you also get those softer points, of course, like Blues for Baby and Me, which is fantastic. This song in particular, I feel, is like Billy Joel's like masturbation material, his blueprint for a lot of his stuff. It's just so hacked out. It's crazy. Like You had to be a big shot, didn't you? It's in there. You can hear it. Just almost totally ripped off. And the album rides momentum well, but I don't think on their own the songs, though great, quite stand up to like the elite 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 tracks which is why i don't have it at five stars but you know have mercy on the criminals awesome the arrangements are so electric i used to hate crocodile rock but now i absolutely love it i think it's genius it's brilliant i just didn't get it when i was like 14 i was like i was like it's the 70s why is he doing this it doesn't make any sense and now i'm like oh okay but yeah i love this album straight through i just don't think it's quite quite like you know the none of these you know were flirting with my top 10 songs list so but still great 4.5 see this is the problem with doing these reviews like joe you know just made it seem like he has a lot of problems with madman across the water but it's you have to defend the rating rather than like how much you love it i love this record yes keep that in mind for my little spiel about the same record don't shoot me number six this is a record that i have a real hard time judging for some reason because i think it does have a lot of good songs but i kind of feel like it among like the elton john classic period this one kind of lacks an identity it almost feels like a, a collection of outtakes or something even with the songs being as good as they are um, it almost doesn't feel like an album opening with daniel doesn't help great song terrible opener uh, probably the worst opening track on an album. Not not song wise, it's a great song, but it's the worst choice of an opener in his catalog. I think uh, does not set the tone for the record at all. Arguably, though, I might say that this is Davy Johnstone's best work on a record. I think his playing is insanely great on this record. Great playing on Elderberry Wine, and the guitar on Crocodile Rock is amazing. Um, you almost don't notice it because there's so much else going on. But if you focus on the guitar playing, his his playing on that track is incredible. And his solo on Midnight Creeper might be the, his best guitar solo in the catalog. I think it's fantastic. Um, 
And so I don't know. I like I appreciate the added diversity because that was an issue on Madman. So like you know you get the fifties rock homage of Crocodile Rock. You get Midnight Creeper, which is his ode to the Stones, and um, you get like some odes to Van Morrison, and he's like trying to emulate other artists, and he's doing that on purpose, and it, and it makes it for an interesting listen, but uh, it feels more disjointed than the later records, and the later records have just as much diversity, but something about the way they're sequenced maybe, or something they hang together better as records than this one does where this one just kind of feels like a collection of very good songs. So four stars for me. Don't shoot me. I'm only reviewing. Don't shoot me. Well, uh, my number six, I guess this makes me the world's biggest rock of the Westies fan. Me and Robert Criscow, actually, who had it number seven in 1975 of all the releases, which is wild. Um, but no, I absolutely love rock of the Westies. I'm going to five stars on it. I don't, I don't even care. I listen to this album uh, infinite amount of times. I can't get enough. These six albums at the top, I probably listen to more than any other album in history. Like I, I listen to them so many times this week, these last couple of weeks. I can just put them on. I love every track. And this one shouldn't work because he fires Olsen and Murray after, you know, arguably his greatest work ever, his most complete, cohesive thing ever. He's like, man, I'm done with these guys. Uh, he gets James Horner, who is an unknown at this time, uh, for Sins and Keys, uh, second guitarist Caleb Quay, who he'd worked with uh, early on, pre-Elton John. And, uh, you know, he retools the rhythm section, and it it still works. It's not quite as good. The backing vocals, not quite as good, but he's still got Davey on there, so they're, they're still good. The bass and drums, you don't quite have that drum sound that you did on um, Captain Fantastic, which might be the best drum sound in history. So this is a little step back. The bass playing, not quite as unique and melodic. But I think you have some really nice, muscular hard rock here. Street Kids is downright like Whovian. Like it, it reminds me of a Who song. Uh, Dan Dare rocks. It's got a great use of uh, talk box from John Stone. Uh, I love Billy Bones and the White Plane. Uh, Elton has like this grit and grime on his vocals a little bit on this one. And I think it's just a little harder, a little more muscular. Um, I think it's, it was a good direction to go. And I wish he had continued in this like harder rocking. Um, even, you know, um, Island Girl and Grow Some Funk of Your Own. Like they have like this muscular backing to them. Uh, and I love those lap steel bursts in Island Girl. That it just it's really unique sounding, really cool, like pseudo Hawaiian island music. Who, who the hell knows? I love Hard Luck Story. I love Feed Me, and it's it's just really listenable, a really interesting direction that I wish he had gone in. I love it. Five stars. The bonus tracks are amazing too. Planes and Sugar on the Floor. Well said. I think we feel the same way about it. Um, you just like it a little more, but yeah, I don't think it gets the credit that it deserves. My number five, I've got Madman Across the Water, and I've got it at 4.5. I don't really agree with any of the criticisms you guys said. Uh, amazing One Two Punch, Tiny Dancer, Leave On, two of the greatest piano songs of all time. And Joe's right, it does beg the question where the hell do you go from here in this album, uh, like in the sequencing? And it's hard for the rest of the album to live up to. I'm not insane. I'm well aware that none of the songs remaining on the album are as good as those two, but I feel like it does a really good job of balancing it out after that. I feel like the album has a more robust sound than anything previous to it. Like, I think Razor Face is just the perfect song to come in in the three hole. It's still upbeat and bombastic, but in a lesser way, so it kind of bridges the gap perfectly. I love the accordion solo on it. So you're still having like those highs from the first two tracks and then you kind of bring it down and then you get the title track which is just awesome it comes right out with that softer more kind of haunting acoustic guitar the second half of the album isn't quite as good which is why i don't have it at five stars if it was just as good to be a five star classic it's still great though i love holiday inn i go back and forth on indian sunset i think it's too much to tackle on 
sometimes I think it's not good. Sometimes I think it's just fine. Yeah, I'm not crazy about rotten peaches. I think it's fun, but I think it's a little out of place. And that's really the only problems I have with this album being, you know, front side heavy and a, a couple just kind of things that bring me out of it a little bit. But overall, I just think it's a collection of just tremendous songs. I think he's on point here. I think John Stone's uh, guitar ripping in Madman Across the Water, which I believe was originally recorded with Mick Ronson, right? And then they redid it again with John Stone. So, you know pretty badass one of i will just say it right now john stone is the most under a guitarist of all time end of story all right my number five is my first 4.5 i've got hunky chateau uh this is the first album with the core band really intact for the whole thing and i think it's immediately noticeable in the more interesting arrangements you got banjo and Horns on the opener, Honky Cat, Pedal Steel on Slave, Mandolin on Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's. There's a tap dance solo on I Think I'm Going to Kill Myself. There's whistles and electric violin and just a lot more going on. It's a lot more color colorful and a lot more interesting, I think, than Madman. It also grooves a little more and gets him out of that like singer-songwriter box. It starts to feel a little bit like an actual rock band here, which I think was a something that was he was due for. Uh, I don't I don't think he could have made another record like Madman. Um, I think the four records I have ahead of this have probably more consistent, better songs uh, for me. I'm not really a huge fan of Rocket Man. I don't think it's a bad song. I think it's a good song. But among his hits, if I ranked all of Elton John's hits, it would be in the bottom five, probably. Um but still, I think it's a very strong album. My favorite tracks on it, probably I think I'm going to kill myself in Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's, which I think are great. So yeah, a uh, very good record. This band, Cram said that Davy Johnstone is the most underrated guitar player ever. I don't know that I agree with that, but I think this band is the most underrated band ever. Not thought of enough because they're backing someone going by their, their name, but without a doubt, this is a band especially as things go on, they just really gel and they're incredible playing together. And yeah, this is the start of that. So four and a half stars for Honky Chateau. Um, Honky Chateau, my number five as well. I get the criticisms, although I think Rocket Man is just spectacular. Jason doesn't like it because of the one line about raising your kids in space and nobody would be there if you did. Doesn't it's the, matter. It's the whole song. The whole song's lyrics <laughs> yeah. are awful. The song is incredible the the bass playing is some of my favorite of all time the space on that uh from d murray the way he doesn't play the things he holds back are just incredible you get you know the band john stone d murray nigel olson you get those backing vocals which are just some of my favorite things in music history um you know rocket man it just sounds so good when they're singing in unison. Um, it's it's crazy. Like it just sounds the drum sounds that Gus Dudgeon or whoever is in charge of the drum sounds, whatever they do, I I don't know if there's a single drummer who has a better sound for me than Nigel Olson. It's just it's like manna from heaven to my ears. It sounds so good every hit. Um, and just the way he plays, a little restrained, it's just gorgeous. The tracks here are great. Uh, get a little bit more of that honky tonk. It's you know, it's right in the first single, Honky Cat. Mellow's great. Uh, I love Susie dramas. Uh, side two, a little Salvation Slave and Amy, maybe a little take foot off the gas, maybe a little too like laid back. Um, but I mean, they all sound incredible. Elton John's piano playing at this point is just peerless. And, uh, you know, a little country western creeps in again. Uh, and you get something like Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's, which sort of transcends, you know, any genre. It's just incredible pop rock. You got that mandolin, which is just amazing. It's just great. Everybody on this album is just at the top of their game doing incredible stuff. And it's just a wonderful friggin' album. Five stars for me. Honky Chateau. Okay, four albums left. All of them five stars. Five stars 
four albums at five stars. Would it be safe to say Elton John is one of my favorite artists ever? Yeah, yeah, I think you're safe to say that. Number four, though, what's it going to be? Tumbleweed Connection, five stars, incredibly brave to go this route after, like, finding himself on the Elton John album. Like, he nails that, and then he's like, you know, I kind of want to do, like, a little Americana thing. Like, just go dive right into that. So cool. And then after that, kind of casually hops back into his other thing. Influenced heavily by the band. You can hear it all over the place, note for note. It's not, you know, it's still diverse. It's not just like a one-trick pony, like, this is my country western, you know, Americana album. No. It has little slices of so many different things in that big bubble. Great guitar. The bluesiness on Ballad of a Well-Known Gun is just so badass. I like how the record moves into the more luring come down in time. Country comfort rules. It's 1,000 times better than anything the evil, the evils, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should start calling them, anything the Eagles ever did. And I kind of feel like that style is like what they were going for. But, and I'll tell you what, Elton just knocks it out of the park. And it gets kind of groovy with Son of Your Father. The bass is the unsung hero on this album. It is perfect. Doesn't overwhelm, just kind of like gives you little, little bounciness here and there. You get the really nice slow burn of My Father's Gun. You get that sort of almost like California Laurel Canyon kind of vibe in there mixed with like some America and CSNY with the way the vocals are layered. Amarina is wonderful. And yeah, that drum sound is apparent here. Everything is so warm and rich. And it's one of those albums when you talk about that warm 70s sound that I think is just one of the ones you got to use as an example. Everything is just perfectly sitting in place for you. Everything has its moment. Everything is crystal clear while also serving a bigger sound altogether. Tumbleweed Connection, five stars, number four. All right. That is my number four. And it's actually down from number two where I had it before. And I'm actually taking it down from five stars to four and a half, which is something I rarely do. Four and a half stars for Tumbleweed Connection. But I do like it a lot. Uh, loose concept album based on Western Americana, as Krem was just saying. But actually, I think a lot of people think that it was inspired by their trip to the U.S. when they were like playing in L.A. at the Troubadour and stuff. Uh, but it was actually written before they ever came to the U.S. And uh, Bernie Toppin said it was completely inspired by music from Big Pink. And I kind of get that. It kind of has that same sort of storytelling quality to it. You get Murray and Olsen together on Amarina, which I think is a great album highlight. One of the great rhythm sections of all time. But really, there's a ton of good songs here. I think the loose theme really helps to hold things together really well. You got a lot of fantastic melodies, everything you want in a 70s singer-songwriter record, great execution, all the playing is great, even though it's not, you know, not the classic band in place yet, but everyone that is playing is doing a fantastic job. Oddly, no U.S. singles released, which is kind of weird after the success of your song and it'd go on to have a bunch of other hits too. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great album. I, I like it a lot. I don't know though. I think I was so into some of the other ones this week that it just felt like I couldn't quite say that this was at the same level. So I had to drop it down. So uh, still great. Tumbleweed Connection number four. That is a concern when you're listening to an artist like Elton John, especially with stuff that maybe I hadn't listened to as much before and the amount of times that I've heard some of these albums, you'd think maybe they dropped for me. Uh, they didn't. Nothing nothing dropped. If anything, they all went up. Uh, my number four, I thought I was the world's biggest caribou stan, but I have to give that title to Jason now because uh, it's only number four for me. And yet, you know, this one gets all this crap. It's like, you know, it's, this one isn't as good. Like, it's a kind of a throwaway. That's bullshit. This is an amazing album. You, Ramder was right. You can't start an album better than The Bitches Back, like ever. <laughs> it's so perfect. Like, just calling Elton, just be like, yeah, I'm the bitch. I'm back. Bernie Toppin's like, hey, Elton, here's a song called The Bitches Back. I want you to sing it. Like, that's just perfect. I love it. It's a great song. I love John Stone's that da 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 and I love this album because it's a little bit, you got the Tower of Power coming in. 
So you get all these big horns. Maybe that's why Kramer doesn't like, he doesn't like horns in his rock music, but I love it. Tower of Power all over this place. Um, you know, there's sax solos. There's stuff you wouldn't really expect from an Elton John record. And to me, this is just like Elton Unchained on the top of the world, just doing whatever he wants. Um, and the band is just so friggin' hot. I mean, John Stone's guitar stuff is incredible. It's almost like you really have to listen to it because it kind of just is there because he's so good, but he's just always doing this incredible stuff. The bass and the drums, again, that drum sound, that Gus Dudgeon production, it all sounds so good. And I mean, maybe Pinky and Grimsby and Dixie Lily are kind of throwaway tracks, but they're so melodic and so much fun. Um, the backing vocals on Pinky are incredible. Grimsby is just a fun little song. Dixie Lily, it's sort of like a tumbleweed, like, you know, Wes uh, Americana feel. But they're just, you know, producing this stuff at this incredible speed. It took nine days to write and record this album, which blows my mind. Uh, I've seen the saucers is great, like totally out of character. Talk about aliens. Um, Stinker is kind of like the bitches back part two. And then it ends with one of my favorite all time ballads. Don't let the sun go down on me. Uh, you know, just get Carl Wilson to sing backing vocals on that. Sure. Why not? Um, it's incredible. I love the drum sound. I say that a lot, but the drum hits on that uh, song are just perfect. And Ticking's an amazing song. It's a really smart, well-written uh, song about a guy going crazy and killing a bunch of people. And a little heavy for this album. It starts with The Bitch's Back, but it works. It, there's no like rhyme or reason to any of these songs. They're just great songs being produced by a killer band at the top of its game. And it's it's great. And I love the bonus tracks. Pinball Wizards, Six City, Cold Highway, Step Into Christmas. They don't count, but I still love them. And I still listen to them every time I listen to this album. Jason disagrees. You do not listen to them every time you listen to that album. He shook his head. He knows I you must. Don't. I must. I, I got to get to Six City, man. Step Into Christmas is awesome. It's so much better than Paul McCartney's Christmas song. It's not even funny. No. Not even close. Denial. All right, number three, I've got Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, five stars. I love the sound of this album. Love the instrument choices. It's warm and grounded, but really pretty also. I think unlike most of the other records, it gets better as it goes on. I think you could probably argue that most of his records, and most records in general, are front-loaded. But this one just gets better and better, and it makes more sense as it goes on, um, just because you're deep into that story. I love the autobiographical nature of the album. It takes you through the first phase of their career, him and Bernie together. Tower of Babel is really good. And yeah, like I have written down one of the best drum-sounding albums ever, but I'll let Joe gush out on it because the drums on this album are just... I don't know what it is, but it, they're just perfect. And I think musically, he's in a really good sweet spot here where there's not too much production. It's not too sappy and more or less has all of the really good elements from all of his best work. Bitter Fingers is really good. I love the opening keys part. There's just tremendous enjoyment in this album. It's very relaxed, but excitable, and it's got humor in it. Love the strings and almost soulful feel of Tell Me When the Whistle Blows. Someone Saved My Life Tonight is just this big, beautiful, heavy ballad anchor right in the middle. The oohs and ahs and everything are just so good. The album just has so much sincerity to it. A love letter of sorts to like their own self-discovery. It's very cool. I think this is his quadrophenia in a lot of ways. There's just a beauty to the approach and execution and no desire to capitalize on popularity or get more radio hits or do what's fashionable. The songs and the story behind the album are just so meaningful and pur purposeful. You know, Gotta Get a Meal Ticket is really nice and rocking. I love the keys on Better Off Dead, one of my favorites on the album. Better Off Dead just missed my top 10 songs tomorrow, spoiler. And the guitar on writing is just awesome. Somehow the guitar part just captures how it feels to like get in the flow of writing a song. It's just so cool, so descriptive. 
Yeah, it's it's perfect. But he's got two more perfect albums to decide from for me. So Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, or also known as um, Captain and the Kid Part One. All right, my number three is Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. And it's kind of the the uh, double album debate. I don't necessarily think that this should be cut down to a single album because there's too many good songs for a single album. But I think there is probably one side's worth of songs that are not as good as the rest. Those being Jamaica Jerk Off, Dirty Little Girl, Your Sister Can't Twist, and Social Disease, which I think are a clear step below everything else. That said, just about everything else is a 10 out of 10. And, you know, even if I don't really need to ever hear Benny and the Jets again or Saturday Night, it's all right for fighting kind of over those songs. They're still great. I don't know. I think this is where the band, too, really, really hits their stride and and somehow shift into another gear. They, like, find this extra gear that shouldn't even exist. Um, The rhythm section is so killer here. And and some of the deep cuts are amazing too. Like on Gray Seal, the bass playing on that song is almost unbelievable. I can't even believe what I'm hearing sometimes. Uh, D. Murray, just incredible. I don't know. He, he might be like top five bass player ever for me. He's just so good. And Ballad of Danny Bailey is amazing. All the Girls Love Alice is great. Plus you've got all those hits that open the record side one just loaded i love the epic scope of it every song is like its self own self-contained like little movie very cinematic quality to it it's a four and a half star plus pull the trigger man someone shoot this piano player it is oh god joe please help me out well i will later um i can't talk about Goodbye, Yellowbrick Road. Yeah, I'm not crazy. Uh, number three, and I kind of feel the same way Jason did about this because I didn't listen to Tumbleweed Connection nearly as much as some of the other ones. And maybe just because it doesn't have the classic band on it. And maybe it's a little, you know, indebted to that country, Western Americana feel. It didn't quite... You know, I've I've just heard it so many times. I I'm keeping it number three. It's still five stars. Made my top five in 1970. And you know, you, you got the hints on Elton John, the self-titled border song, "Take Me to the Pilot," a little bit of that country rock, um, that big raucous piano forward style built on this sort of like country framework. Uh, and he kind of just does a whole album like that. Um, Belt of Well Gun, Country Comforts, Under Your Father, My Father's Gun. Uh, very much, you know, taking the spirit and the time of the Civil War, kind of infusing it into these you know, honky tonk. Like, I don't even know exactly what style you'd call this. Um, you know, it's country western. It's full of colorful characters and colloquialisms and little details and racism and uh, some great band performances from got Caleb Quay and a, a bunch of people that aren't his normal band, but still incredible players. Um, a lot of those like backing vocals that sound like a, you know, a church choir out in the Midwest somewhere, including Dusty Springfield, which is great. Um, you know, the, the production from Gus Dudgeon, fantastic. There's enough variety in songs like Come Down in Time and Love Song and uh, Where To Now St. Peter that it's not just a full-on Americana, like, you know, overload. Got some nice strings from Paul Buckmaster. Uh, some great instrumentation. You got the Hammond, the 12 strings, and the steel guitars, and the acoustic guitars, and harmonica, and violin, and harp, and oboe, and all this cool stuff coming in. And it's just a really well-written, well-produced, well-played uh, album. And I think the the theme sort of, like, nails them to doing this kind of cohesive, consistent thing, which helps. I mean, I love their all over the place wild stuff, but having something like this and kind of the same thing they do on uh, Captain Fantastic, where the theme kind of helps drive them and kind of sharpens their focus a little bit. 
So um, I don't know, it's five stars. I mean, it's great. It's fantastic. All right. For those of you who have followed the channel, may know that this is kind of a big moment for me. Hockey Chateau versus Goodbye Yellow Brick Road has always been a marquee heavyweight matchup for me. I've alluded to it many times before. Hockey Chateau won for me an album of the year in a weaker year of 72 compared to 73. My number two is Goodbye Yellow Brick Road five stars this is the best daniel johnstone daniel this is the best <laughs> this is the best johnstone has heard his guitar parts he's got like seven memorable parts in funeral for a friend alone then just like that up in the clouds part and candle in the wind is so majestic the fire he puts into saturday night's all right for fight like it's just a guitar masterpiece on this album. Then there's the piano parts. Like, if you're, you know, shallowly into playing rock music and you're just like one of the parts guys, this album has everything. It, like, so many just memorable parts, memorable melodies. It's awesome. The performances on Funeral for a Friend alone, the little touches, like those little bass notes that come in the soft opening piano part, just like one at a time, just like carefully like like leading you with like little pieces of bread into the rest of the song like come this way like boom boom it's just perfect beautiful like jason said every song is just like the cinema scope it's like an album with itself it just takes you on such a journey obviously you get the five just massive hits with funeral candle in the wind benny goodbye yellow brick road and saturday night but the other tracks to me are so underrated they're still excellent songs i love jamaican jerk off i love gray seal i love alice i love i've seen that movie too it's just some of the best music the 70s has to offer everything is so memorable everything is pretty everything is just giant and full of grandeur and he, the passion is everywhere everything comes together it's just like you know a game of thrones of albums just everything is just massive and you can't wait for the next song to come on because you're like exhausted from how awesome the last one was but you're excited for the next one it's perfect i never doubted for a moment that you were going honky chateau i knew it uh i mean i planned to go goodbye yellow brick road but i switched four days ago like he knows then, you better than you know yourself is what he's saying i didn't know i was gonna have a heavyweight matchup on my hands i first sort of really got into caribou the last time i went through the discography and i put it at number four then and i thought wow i'm putting it higher than a lot of people then and it only grew even more this time i absolutely love it uh, so this is really like a 1A and 1B situation. I'm going Caribou number two, but as you'll see in my songs list, there's a strong argument to, to be made that this could be my favorite. I really, really, really love this record. It got lukewarm reviews when it came out. Gus Dudgeon talked a bunch of crap on it, which maybe led to people having a, a lesser view of it. He said it was like terrible sounding and that the songs went nowhere and all this stuff, so... I don't know. The only argument that I maybe can see him having a point is that I think the guitar tones on this record are worse than they are on some of the other classic records. They're a little thin. The rest of the record sounds fantastic. Uh, I don't know. I over The overall sound is, is great. I don't know. It's, to me, the songs and the playing are just off the charts. The Bitches Back is the best opener that Elton's got. Daniel's the worst. Just such a great way to open things. Pinky and Ticking, I think, are underrated masterpieces. Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me is a appropriately rated masterpiece. I love the campiness of uh, Solar Prestige, I on, and D. Murray is so, so good on this album. So underrated. There were like six of, whether there are 10 songs on it, I think there were like six of them were in consideration for my top 10. I just think it is front to back. Just great song after great song after great song. And the playing and the arrangements are basically perfect. And the harmonies are on this record are amazing. So, I, yeah, I just, I love it. This is five stars.
Well, it's an interesting album to have at five stars. And it it just kept growing on me too as well. Every time I would listen to it. And the, the one hold up for me was always Solar Prestige Agamon, but now I like that too. Uh, at the top for me, I got a, a battle here. We all have our, had our battles. Um, and I'm sticking with my favorite. I, I didn't make any sudden movements here at the end. Number two is going to be Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. And it's real close uh, to being my number one just because it's so consistent and so well put together. And, you know, the lyrics, I think, are Toppin's best. I think when they're a little more grounded in something, which is, you know, in this case, their story, their autobiographical um, journey from their humble roots as songwriters to, you know, the universe conquering music gods. And it's, you know, it's 1975. Every album they put out immediately goes to number one. This soul just you know, a million copies in its first like week or something. Just, he's the most popular musician in the whole world. And this is like a very non like glitzy sort of like rootsy stripped down uh, album, which is just very weird. Like you think Goodbye Yellow Brick Road would be like his ultimate, like here I am the rock star. But 1975 was he was at his peak. And yet here they, you know, they take a little more time to make this album. And it's just so cohesive and focused. Um, the music jumps around. You got like country rock on uh, Captain Fantastic. You got like a little Philly soul on Tell Me When the Whistle Blows. You got soft rock and writing. Um, you got that epic, classically influenced, um, you know, ballad. Somebody saved my life. Someone saved my life tonight. They all work so well. The band sounds amazing. The drum sounds incredible just absolutely incredible i don't know how like how did gus dudgeon not do more like you look at his production credits he like completely falls off after elton so whatever whoever was in charge of the drum sounds and the bass sounds and the production i mean somebody else had to be there or something because you just don't fall off uh, but it, it sounds so unbelievably good it's perfect it's perfect but like it doesn't have eight uh, radio pop gems that I can listen to a thousand times in a row and not get tired of. And that's really the only thing that separates is like, do you go for the glitz and glamour of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road or kind of the, the homespun, you know, tale of these two guys? And I, I got to go with the glitz and the glamour. So, uh, but it is like a perfect record. I feel bad putting it number two. Because it's so unbelievably good and sounds so unbelievably good. So tough. Tough to have it at number two. Uh, but one one better. Yeah. Everything about Elton John's best stuff like is so taken for granted outside of Elton and Bernie. Like all everyone just so underrated and underappreciated. They never show up on lists. They're never talked about in their, you know, respective instruments. It sucks. My number one is Honky Chateau for two reasons is edging it out. There are more songs that I love. And the style is just like, unlike anything else in his catalog. It's got this cool, like, almost like burlesque vaudevillian jazz and blues and southern sophisticated sleaze kind of mashup. I think it's his best vocal performance on so many of the songs starts off with honky cat which is like nothing else in his catalog i think he like gets really kind of sassy with it it's very cool it's lots of fun at times it's got like a big jazzy feel instead of those like sweetheart wrenching strings there's just a really cool almost like drunken darkness to it at times like mellow is very shadowy and somberish uh the musicianship everywhere is amazing like Jason says the first album where they feel like a band like they just feel like this big kind of traveling like brass band almost just killing it with rock tunes I think I'm gonna kill myself is great just missed my top 10 I absolutely love the little touch of how it opens up in the middle parts like the seas parting I love the rift in the family I can't use the car line Susie is terrific I love the lead guitar in that the solo is great one of his best solos maybe the most unappreciated solo in his catalog 
salvation hits a bit more hopeful and uplifting beauty that the album needs so it rounds out the feeling of the album well slave is a great little varietal change up acoustic guitar coming in with more of a country feel amy great piano just the songs are so entertaining the way he plays piano on it just roll rolls over the ivories like tumbling dice mona lisa's and mad hatters like it's just got really odd production like you get banjo in one part and then the mandolin coming in and mona lisa's it's just amazing uh, i i think it's just start to finish his most complete album not one thing i would change not one song i don't like or want to hear no holes i've never been higher on it than i am now it's immaculate all right my number one, we got three different number ones, and uh, we're covering a lot of the bases. I think these are probably three of the more highly thought of ones, so hopefully we're making a lot of the viewers happy. Um, I got Captain Fantastic, which I kind of think of as like an ever so slightly more polished version of, of Caribou. And I think the the concept, I think, works well to tie things together. It's It's kind of like a neater package. Um, even though I think the songwriting is actually kind of similar, um, melodically speaking, uh, the mix here, probably a little bit fuller, but I think the writing and the playing are kind of maintaining that same high level that was on caribou, uh, only one single from this record, someone saved my life tonight, but which I think is a total banger. I love that song, but actually I think having fewer hits on the record actually helps the cohesive album feel because sometimes when I'm listening to an Elton John record, like I'll get to the single and it's like, I'm no longer listening to don't shoot me. I'm listening to crocodile rock. Like it just kind of pulls you out. So I think the lack of like major radio hits here is actually a benefit to the record. Um, this was the last record with the classic lineup. Elton fired the rhythm section after this one, they go out on top with some killer killer playing. Got to get a meal ticket that that performance is so good. I love curtains as a closer that like long outro where they're just like riding off into the sunset almost is how it feels with all those great Tom fills from Nigel Olson and the harmonies. And there's like this hypnotic guitar line going on throughout it. I uh, just love it. Like I said before, this is kind of like neck and neck with caribou. I think caribou is probably the more exciting, like eccentric record. And this is more of like a neat tidy package where everything is like in its right place. So I, I think objectively it's probably better, but I don't know, neck and neck for me, but I'm sticking with captain fantastic. I think it's so well made. The playing is at such a high level and the songs are great. So there you go. Yeah. I like, I like what you said about the lack of radio hits being a big part of it, because given the theme of the album and the like autobiographical nature, it feels like you're in it with them. And you're like, you're like, this is their story and they're telling it to you, you know, we're this band who has this, you know, incredible big hits that, you know, but here's our story. And I'm just telling it to you. It's like your little secret with them. It's cool. I do think that's probably their best album. Like is, is taking the idea of an album like that's their best like the concept of an album that's their best album but their best album is the one just packed with hit after hit after hit after incredible song uh and filled with deep cuts as well goodbye yellow brick road my 73 winner and i could even like i could make the case to get rid of like two or three of these songs i probably wouldn't even miss them and yet that's how strong this album is that it doesn't matter at all. Like side three, I could just get rid of, it. I don't even care. Just get rid of side three. I wouldn't even notice. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, they're all good songs, but like, I don't know. The, the whole album is just so full of great songs. Um, side one, Funeral for a Friend, Love Lies Bleeding, which were two songs that kind of combined into one um both incredible like a little prog influence you got uh david henschel playing an arp synthesizer uh gets all those spacey sounds and uh john wrote it because he wanted like a, a song to be played at his funeral and it works perfectly it's this dirge it's kind of builds up in intensity and segues perfectly into love lies bleeding which like ramser said just has some of the great guitar parts like underrated under the radar it's just 
Perfection from John Stone. And I think that's the song that made me realize how good he was. I was just like, this is just like tucked away in minute nine of Elton John's, you know, uh, double album. And they're all over, like the guitar part in um, Candle in the Wind, which is sort of like people think it's like this kind of soppy over the top ballad. It's incredible guitar work going on in there. The, the song's great. Benny and the Jets is one of those songs like my mom hates because she grew up like in the 70s and I'm sure she's heard it eight bajillion times. And for a while there, I was tired of it. And now it's kind of come back around where I listen to them. Like this song is absolutely amazing. Like I don't care that I've heard it 8,000 times. Completely unique. It's completely weird. It's like glammy really weird piano part in it like it it shouldn't have been like a number one hit or whatever it was but it was like it just there's something about these songs uh for 1973 that are just bigger and, and better than i think people even think they are despite them being like number one hits and like universally beloved i think people just you know they're so catchy and you know they're earworms and stuff like that but underneath the playing of Johnson and Olson and Murray and Elton's you know, piano and Toppin's lyrics. I just, I think they're somehow underrated despite how like universally beloved kind of some of this stuff is. Goodbye Yellow Brick Roads, the song's perfect. I've seen that movie too, has this incredible uh, backwards guitar solo in it. Um, side four, Your Sister Can't Twist is kind of a throwaway, but I love it and I love the way it, segues into Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, which is another song you've heard 8 million times. And I've been listening to it like nonstop this whole week because I love it again. It's like come back around. Um, I love Roy Rogers, kind of country, uh, Western. I love Social Disease. I think it's an amazing song. I would definitely not get rid of that. And then it ends with Harmony, which is a, like a, literally a perfect song it's what number 24 or whatever on the album. It's literally perfect. It's at the very end. I don't even know if people know about this song. It's just perfect. It's two minutes and 46 seconds of just perfection. It's a perf it's a perf it's a perfect way to end the album. And it has perfect backing vocals and perfect drums and perfect guitar. And it's just this this whole album is incredible. It, it might not even be his best album, but the songs on it. He's just like, F you to the world. I'm going to write 25 unbelievable songs and you're going to love every minute of it. And he was right. It's 90 minutes of just awesomeness or 76 minutes, sorry. 76 minutes of just pure awesomeness. So it is my number one. I think it was Harmony that I read that was going to be the next single. And they were like, ah, but Caribou is coming out soon. So we're just <laughs> going to kind of let this album go. And uh, but yeah, that would have been interesting if if we were hearing Harmony on the radio all the time. I'd love it. Final thoughts? Awesome. Just awesome. It, maybe a later discussion about this, but, you know, there's a burnout because there's a lot of crap. There was a lot of 2 and 2.5s in there. But, you know, if you make two of the best records of all time, you can make 20 lousy ones and you're still going to be an icon. And he made, like, to me like nine you know eight or nine great records so you do your thing after that chicken wing his his hit rate it's like sort of 25 percent or whatever and yet like i love him and i love all these records and i'll just totally forget that victim of love and ice on fire and leather jackets ever existed like i always do and i'm just going to keep listening to these you know 10 12 unbelievable albums till the day i die it's amazing how many hits he had even on those a lot of those bad records like through the 80s and most of the 90s and all those records have at least one song that you still hear almost constantly so he knows how to write a hit that's elton john let us know what you think how you rank them what you think of our list all that stuff Hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, check the description for Patreon and uh, Facebook and all that stuff. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.